All right, let's continue talking scheme macros. If you'll recall, we're talking about scheme macros in the context of mini Canron programming because I want to ground the discussion of macros in real world problems and real world language design. So in the past, we've done some macros for testing and also some macros for defining special syntax for relations like the define relation syntax and also, you know, things like test diverge. So now let's get to sort of the main event of where, where I wanted to start this series, which was an alternative run interface for Mini Kenrin. So you can see I've defined a pendo again. I mean, I guess we could do the, the defrel version of it, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Um, but the point is we have a pendo defined as a relation and we've seen this sort of behavior before. So I can do a run star and I'll say run star with query variable Q of a pendo, say list one, two, three to list four, five to Q. Okay, we get one answer, but we can also say X and Y. So we're gonna concatenate X and Y to get one, two, three, four, five. In this case, we have six answers. Like that, okay? Now, if I wanted to, I could do a run three and get the first three answers. I could do a run in, I could do a run 100. In this case, I only have six answers, so I get those six answers. I can also do a version of the query where there are an unbounded number of answers. There are infinitely many answers. There are infinitely many values x, y, and z, such that if I append y to the end of x, I get z. So here is one abstract answer with underscore zero representing a logic value, or sorry, a logic variable that could have any value. Um, I could do a second one. I'm not going to get into the structure of these. If you know Mini Canrin, uh, you probably know how to read these. If not, we'll talk about these in some sort of Mini Canrin series, but you know it, that doesn't really matter. The point is, in this case, there are infinitely many results. So if I were to use a run star, it would diverge because the way run star works is the entire uh, list of answers has to be produced and then everything's returned at once. So if uh, there are infinitely many answers or if maybe there are five answers and then if you ask for a sixth answer, there's an infinite loop because maybe there is no sixth answer, but Mini Canron keeps doing a search forever looking for one, then the run star will diverge or go in an infinite loop. Uh, similarly with the run in, if you ask for five answers and there's six, that's fine. If you ask for six, do a run six and there's six, fine, you get all six. If you do a run seven and there are only six answers, you might get back six answers or you could get an infinite loop. Furthermore, so okay, so from that standpoint, the safe way to do these things, you know, let's go back to this example. Okay. So I can ask for run six. All right. So if I'm afraid that a run seven might diverge, and it might, depending on the definition of a pendo in Mini Canron, um, then I have to be careful. In fact, let me define a version of a pendo that will diverge in some cases. So here we we have these two unifications and then the recursive call. Um, so if I move these things around like that, okay, that's gonna cause some havoc, it turns out. Um, if you ask for more answers than exists, let's see, if I do a run seven, you can see now it diverges. If we do a run six, it returns with uh, six answers. So this, by the way, is showing an undesirable property of Turing complete logic programming, which is conjunction isn't actually commutative. 
that's an Achilles heel of Mini Canrin and Prologue. You can have subturing complete languages that are restricted like data log, where at least in theory, if you're not worried about performance, um, you know, semantically at least, uh, conjunctions commutative. So that's getting a little beyond uh, what I want to talk about from the macro standpoint. But just, you know, for this example, we can see that if I didn't know how many answers there were, I, I could get into trouble very easily. Because if I do a run se uh, star diverges, because you will never get the seventh answer. Um, and if I do a run seven, it diverges because there are only six answers and trying to get a seventh non-existent answer diverges. And if I do a run six, fine, we get them back. But if I didn't know there were six answers, then really what I'd have to do is something like do a run one. And if that worked, do a run two or I could do a binary search or things like that, but I would have to you know, work up my way one result at a time. And then, you know, maybe I would try run seven and it would, I, I could either time it out, you know, something like that. <clears throat> um, but you could see that it could be useful to build up individual answers one at a time and so I could do this uh, sort of run one through one six. However, there's an issue there, which is if I do a run six and I already did a run five, the run six is redoing all the work. Okay, so we're not caching the answers. If we had a tabling system, which is like a form of memoization for logic programming, and we, we tabled the appendo relation, okay, then you know, maybe we can get away with having run six, uh, just do an incremental amount of work to get the extra answer. Um, there, there are techniques we could use like that. But the other approach would be to keep around the partial computation. So, you know, like the stream of results so, the, um, so that if we want an additional answer, we can just ask for it. So that's an alternate interface. And one programming language which famously supports that is Prolog. So let us install, let's see, SWI Prolog. All right. And we're going to try uh, writing a very simple Prolog query just so we can make sure we understand how that works. So let's see, SWI uh, PL. There we go. Um, so this this question mark uh, hyphen thingy that you see that's that means we're you know writing a query. So I can say append uh, x y to the list one two three four five. Okay. So this is equivalent to what we were, uh, the, the previous query we were exploring that has six answers. Now, if I hit return, we see that there's a result giving us the, an assignment for X and an assignment for Y that would make the relation hold. So if X is the empty list and Y is the list one, two, three, four, five, then appending, you know, or concatenating X and Y together gives you list one, two, three, four, five. Now here's the critical thing. If I want an additional answer, I just press semicolon. All right, now I got the second answer. If I type semicolon again, I get an additional answer. Semicolon again, semicolon again. If I want to, I can press period, and then we're done. It, it cuts it off. You know, so I said maybe I only want the one answer. Period. We're done. However, I can keep hitting semicolon. And eventually I get this false back. That means there are no more answers. Okay. So this is an interface that is sort of the standard prolog REPL interface where I can keep pulling effectively from a stream of, of answers or keep saying, okay, do more computation. Give me the next, next result. So that can be very handy in certain cases, like especially if uh, divergence is a possibility. 
or where you're not sure how much of an answer you need and um, you want to avoid doing duplicate work. So what I want to do is create an alternate run interface for Minikanren, in particular the faster version, faster Minikanren implementation that Michael Ballantyne uh, created to allow for this sort of incremental pulling from the stream of answers. So I can get my results one at a time, similar to what we're doing at the Prolog REPL. Now I'm not insisting that the user type semicolon or type period or that kind of thing. I could write my own REPL loop. In fact, uh, there's this idea of a new cafe or a waiter in Shea where I could install a little interpreter and have that work at the REPL and I could look for semicolon. But I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna try to stay uh, more mini kenrin and more schemish in my syntax. And I've already written a version of this. All right. So let's try loading this. Run interface experiments one.scm. Okay. So I have loaded this macro, which I'm calling run a little, run hyphen a hyphen little. Probably not the greatest name, but I wanted to, you know, drive the point home as to what it does. Now, this macro looks kind of complicated probably because it's long and it has a bunch of inscrutable scheme code. My argument is the macro is actually not that complicated what is somewhat complicated or subtle at least is there's a bunch of mini Canron implementation details and guts that are in this macro. And so, you know, you have to know what suspend means and, and how mini Canron handles uh, streams, the implementation faster mini Canron handles streams. And you have to know what state with scope is and non-local local scope and reify uh, all that sort of thing. Um, so that's, that's the part that's really complicated. I mean, it's not super complicated. People can understand it. But the point is, when you look at a macro like this, you have to tease apart the essential difficulty and the accidental difficulty. The accidental difficulty is the fact that, you know, we've got things like state with scope. Now, where did I get this code? <clears throat> this like suspend and state with scope stuff? Well, I looked up the code in Faster Mini Canron, so I went to mk.scm, and I, I did things like look at the definition of the existing run macro. Okay, so run is a macro. Run star is a macro that calls run. Okay, so the run star macro is actually pretty simple. It just calls run with hash f as the first argument. And then the run macro has two different clauses. There's a pattern here, and then there's an alternate pattern here, and they differ in how many query variables are supported. So this version only supports a single query variable. That's sort of the classic mini Canron run syntax. This version supports multiple query variables. And you can see that the extension that supports multiple query variables ends up expanding to a call to the run macro that has a single query variable that doesn't exist in this list that's an introduced variable and then it wraps a fresh around the the code okay so um, so run is is a macro that can call itself in this case and so sort of the interesting part of the macro in in a real sense is this part right here in terms of what's interesting from a mini Canron standpoint, this take and suspend. I don't want to go into a lot of detail about this. I'll just say that there's a notion of a stream and a stream is, you can think of it as a list where the computations can be delayed. So it's a list where the values in the list can be produced lazily. So if you want to represent a list of infinitely many values, like all the prime numbers, for example, 
you know, because they're infinitely many, you can't create a concrete list that fits within a finite amount of memory, but you can create this stream structure where you're allowed to keep asking for what is the next uh, bit in the list. And whenever you ask for the next bit of the list, a computation occurs to produce just enough, lazily, just enough of the list where you can get the next element. And then you also have somehow a handle to the remainder of the computation to generate more of the list if you want to. That's the idea of one of these streams. So the suspend is saying that we want to delay a computation and we, we're we doing this, uh, all the stuff with mini Kenrin goals and uh, states and you know things that are interesting but not entirely relevant. Um, what take is doing is it is taking in elements at the beginning of the stream and turning it into a list. And in particular, turning into a reified list. That means that the uh, if a logic variable X happens to be associated with the number five, in the list that's produced by take, you would see the number five instead of um, some representation of the logic variable if X appears in the answer. So. Anyway, that's the, the very, very high level view of what's going on with this code. The important thing is I didn't actually have to know what this code does. I, I do know what it does, basically. Um, but I was able to basically just copy the code. I just grabbed it and put it into my macro definition, right? So I didn't have to understand it all completely. I just had to understand the interface well enough to know that, hey, we have to produce a stream and that called a suspend outside of this uh, call passing the empty state to a goal produced by fresh, well, that's a stream, okay? So this whole thing, that whole expression produces a stream, which you can think of as a lazy list. And okay, what are we gonna do with the stream? Well, we're gonna define a function called next, which takes no arguments, and it's gonna do some stuff with a stream. So it's gonna you know, let bind old stream to be um, my stream, which is the stream we're starting with. And then it's going to set my stream to be the value of calling my stream. And then it's going to do what's called a case inf, which is a mini Kenrin concept. This goes back to Ken Shan, um, where we're going to look at, you basically dispatch on the four types of different streams in the mini Kenrin or the faster mini Kenrin implementation. And then we're going to do some things. By far the trickiest part of this code from the macro standpoint is the fact that we're doing some mutation here, these set bangs. So you have a set bang here and a set bang here and a set bang here. And the reason we're doing mutation is we want to keep track of the state of the stream as it's changing because when we pull from the stream to get an answer, we want to know what is the new rest of the stream that we can call on later for additional uh, parts of the answer. So that's that's what those set bangs are about. So we can see that um, we have this next function. Okay, great. And we're going to call the next function. We can also see that our interface to run a, a little is, is a little bit different from the run or run star interface. We still have a query variable. In this case, we have a query variable length one. And we have one or more goal expressions that follow the query variable, just like in a regular run or run star. But we also have this next thing. And what this is, this is a name that the user is gonna provide for the function that they can call to get the next answer back. Okay, so the user is actually gonna provide this, it's not built in. So so the, the procedure isn't actually called next, the procedure is called whatever uh, the, the user wants, they could call it foo or give me another, whatever. Um, it's up to them to choose the name, but we're abstractly pattern matching against that name that they give and calling it next. We'll show an example in a minute. The alt alternate pattern that we can match is similar to, um, you know, the, the alternate version of the run interface in that we are also allowing multiple um, variables, okay? So we don't have to, multiple query variables. So we don't just have to have the one query variable, we can have multiple query variables, and we're doing the same trick 
where if there are multiple query variables, we introduce a new uh, single query variable and then wrap a fresh around everything. And, and then uh, that, that query variable uh, gets the values that, uh, you know, the value of the, the main query variable then is the value of the individual query variables uh, wrapped in the list. So it's, a, it's very similar to the trick that's done with run in Faster Mini Canron. Okay, so that's a little bit complicated. Well, let's try using this. Okay. All right. So instead of uh, doing run, what we're going to do is run a little. And remember, we have to give a name now for our next function. How about give me more? There we go. That's the name of it. All right. So when I when I uh, hit return, I get back the first answer from uh, the appendo. So X is going to be the empty list. Y is going to be list one, two, three, four, five. It's just exactly like in prologue. Now I can call the function gimme more, and I get the next answer back. And I can call it again, and I can call it again, and I can call it again, I can call it again. Okay. Now, in this case, it diverged uh, because I had redefined the appendo so that it will diverge if an answer doesn't exist. So let's go back and um, swap back the appendo uh, recursive call to last position. Let's try it again. Okay. So we can do give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more. Okay, what happens now? All right, now we get back the symbol done. And if I call give me more again, keep getting back done. So that's the interface. One decision about the interface that I came up with is that I'm not using the name give me more, okay, that or, or the name next, okay? So I'm not taking up a name for that procedure that gives you the next thing. The responsibility is for the person calling run a little to decide what they want that function to be called. The other decision I've made is that I am going to represent the end of that computation, the, the fact that there are no more answers left, with the symbol done. Okay, so if I look here, we can see that I have quote done. Now, if I want to, I could modify it. I could say, you know, in the interface, I could say, you know what? I will actually want the user of run a little to explicitly say what symbol or value they want to have returned. Okay, make, make the uh, user do that. One reason you might consider doing that is that say that you're doing some sort of mini Canron computation that could legitimately return done as a result. Well, now we're in trouble because we can't tell, did mini Canron, the computation, return the symbol done just as, as one of the results? Or does it mean there are really no more answers left? So by allowing the user to specify what they want as their done value, we make sure that the user can avoid that problem. So that would be one way we could ch change the interface. So if you want to, you can play around with that. If you're going to play around with that, just make sure that um, you also add done here and then that you pass done in to the recursive call. Actually, why don't we just do that? Let's just go ahead and do it. Let's do that. All right. Right, okay. Done. See if this works. Give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more. Done. There we go. See? That's simple. We just changed how it works. And now, if we have a computation that returns done for some reason, you know, we could do something else. Okay? We could 
you know, my done, or we could pass in a gen sum or whatever we want. Um, so you know, we could change the interface. So, so the interface is flexible in that you can pick the name for your procedure that grabs the next value. And you can also um, pick the value you want for uh, when the computation's finished and it's going to return something. So that's a very schemely thing to allow you to pick, say, the done name. Okay. So that's a little bit of uh, interface design. Now, we could also try to go with some default values. So obviously, I had a default value for done. It was literally just the symbol done. Um, often, like hash f is treated as some special, special value like a sentinel value but once again it's that's a dangerous thing to do because it's totally reasonable you might have a computation that returns hash f as one of the values so you know this is a a much safer interface that you can program around you could try to make it more convenient in various ways but the nice thing about this is you know you can definitely program in a way where you're not going to get a clash with the names this is very critical to the scheme language philosophy is that the name should not be special. There shouldn't be names that are reserved that you're not allowed to change or where you have to program in a way where it's unsafe that if it just happens to be somehow, if uh, you pick the wrong name and you don't know it, the system comes crashing down. You know, um, you know, Kent Devig apparently has said that uh, name should never matter. That's, something I heard from Aziz. Okay, so the idea is name shouldn't matter. Pick any name you want. Okay, so I actually kind of like this interface. Uh, obviously, we don't have to have the user pass this in. I mean, that'd be another way to do it, was we could we could have <clears throat> an alternate sy syntax yet again, right? So we could do something like this, where if they don't pass in um, an explicit done, we could do a call to run a little and pass in the rest of this, but also pass in, you know, quote done or quote done or whatever we want uh, and just have like a default, you know, so that would be an alternate uh, interface. You know, so we could say, okay, if you want to control, you you've got it. But if you don't care about the control, we'll just you know return whatever whatever value makes sense. So so that could be uh, a way you could define it. Next, I think is more interesting because you know here we have to produce we have to define a function uh, called next, and we have to make its name available to the programmer, and so that can start getting into issues of hygiene and so forth. So that was, that was the real reason I passed that name in explicitly is that it just avoids all those issues with, you know, trying to uh, bend the hygiene or break the hygiene or how, however people want to talk about it with the macros. Uh, just pass in the name. You don't have to worry about any of those things. So that's a simple way of doing things where you just have the person calling the macro pass in the name for the function you want. And so remember, this is all being expanded. So it's not that we're actually defining a, func uh, a function called next. It's we're defining a function called whatever the the person calling the macro chose. Okay. Um, in fact, let's let's just see what this expansion looks like. Okay. Well, that's kind of epic. All right. That's pretty long. We can do our trick of print gen sim hash f and expand it again. You know, it looks uh, more you know more reasonable, I guess, but it's still pretty long. Like I mean, look at the font size to try to fit it on the screen. It's pretty small, um, but it works. It works. Now, I showed this macro to Michael Ballantyne, who is a macro expert, uh, especially racket macro expert. And his critique was, 
you know, it's fine. That works. That's that's a reasonable design. You know, the the interface is okay. Um, however, looking at this code, there is a lot of code in here that doesn't really need to be in the macro expansion. So for um, if you really look at this code carefully, most of the code, uh, you know, like this uh, Lambda ST and, you know, state with scope and all that stuff, you know, uh, well, this doesn't have to be in the macro generated code. And you could lift a lot of this code out to helpers that are outside of the macro and outside of the macro expansion. And why might you want that? Well, one reason, like we talked about before, is imagine that we've written a whole bunch of macros and the macros are all, you know, including these definitions everywhere. We haven't tried to pull out, um, you know, sort of procedures that could be uh, defined top level or, or within an outer scope. Uh, you can get in this situation where when the macro expansion triggers, you know, a macro expands to a macro expands to a macro expands to a macro. And now you've got 20 megabytes of code that the compiler has to handle. And that might be very expensive. There may be lots of duplicated definitions, all that sort of thing. Whereas if you pulled out these uh, procedural definitions, for example, or abstracted over the definitions, um, and just parameterize those definitions with just the little bit you need from, from the macro call, then it would avoid all of that duplicate work, the duplicate expansion. You could avoid exponential expansion in some cases. So as a general rule, you want to pull out the procedural code that you can, that can live at a, at a higher level outside of the macro. And you only want to generate things like calls to those procedures um, where maybe you're changing the semantics. Instead of call by value, maybe you want to call by name or call by need, or maybe you want to have a new binding form or something like that. But then the rest of the work that doesn't really have to be a macro, well, use your standard scheme, use our standard procedural abstractions or other types of abstractions you have instead of just expanding everything to gigantic you know, expression that you know, the compiler might choke on. Um, now, a good compiler should be able to handle really big expressions. Like I know Shea Scheme, at least an old version of Shea Scheme, could handle 500,000 line let expressions. Um, before libraries, that's what people would do. They would wrap all their code in one gigantic let expression. So Shea can, Shea can handle that sort of thing, but Shea can probably do a better job if you have smaller chunks of code. And the nice thing is that you can just debug that code, test that code the way you would uh, just normal procedural code. You can trace it and do the prints and all that. Whereas the code that you're expanding to, it can be harder to trace it. It can be harder to see what's going on with the hygiene and, and those sorts of things. So as a general rule, you want to pull that stuff out that doesn't really need to be in the macro. And what Michael... Uh, ended up doing, or Michael and I ended up doing, um, were doing a, a number of refactors of the macro I just showed you and doing different types of cleanup. Okay, so we started one version of, uh, of the macro and we abandoned it because the mutation, the, the, the set bang was making it hard to refactor. So we decided to try to refactor uh, the mutation first, um, you can see here, got a little, uh, we're starting to see the helpers. So here's a, a helper for the testing. And then here's a take one, uh, K and where we pulled out, you know, the take aspect of it. Um, and then we're, you know, so we're, we're doing various types of little refactoring. So you can see, you know, Michael started adding type annotations here. Uh, so we can start keeping track of the types of things. And over time, we massaged these definitions uh, more and more. So you can see we pulled next out. So next doesn't actually have to be in the macro expanded code. Um, so we played these games and you could see that we're getting the code down uh, less and less. 
And so now my stream is uh, top level. And we're setting it to hash f initially. You know, uh, so we're doing all that sort of thing. Reify as a goal. Pull that out. And we eventually ended up with this code, run a little RT. Uh, I don't remember what RT stands for. But now here is the macro. So the macro has shrunk incredibly. It's extremely small compared to what it was. And you can sort of focus on the structure of the macro, on the, the need to do um, you know the binding here, uh, you know that, that sort of thing. And run a little, yeah, so, so in this version, take one K, in this version, because next is a top level function, we don't have to pass in next as, you know, we don't have to pass in the name for next anymore. So let's, let's try this version. And so let's uh, try, I think I've got some, <clears throat> yeah, we have a little test here. So let's do our appendo example. All right. <clears throat> now we can call next and next and next and next and we're done. And by the way, I wanted to make sure that if you called next more than once, um, you didn't get an error. So if you weren't you know, like, like the first version I uh, had, if you called next a second time, you get an error because the stream was done. So I had to write the, the macro a little, a little more carefully to make sure that that worked. Um, but now you can see this interface has been simplified. Uh, the interface is simplified because you don't have to enter the name of the done function. If you wanted to, you could add, um, or sorry, the next function. If you wanted to, you could add, you know, uh, you could you could change the interface a little bit. Sorry, we go here. Um, you could change the interface a little bit like we did in the first version, so it could take a sort of like sentinel value you want to return at the very end, so that the the symbol done isn't somehow taken, so that your computation can actually return done, and you can tell your mini Kenrin computation return done from you know, done meaning there are no more answers. So if you wanted to, um, you could take this last version and update the interface to allow you to pass in whatever you wanted to here. So um, it's pretty impressive how small the macro got. And remember these dot, dot, dots mean zero or more occurrences of what's beforehand. So, you know, the fact that you see dot, dot, dots all over the place tells you that, yeah, this, this part really needs to be a macro. Um, but everything else got pulled out, including the next function. Um, so, you know, if you know scheme, you can read this. Okay, you, you might have to know what kcenf is. Okay, fine. You know, we describe kcenf in, in various descriptions of mini-canron. You can look at the faster mini-canron code in mk.scm. It describes how kcenf works uh, for the four, you know, it's a pattern matching on different types of, of streams, basically. Um, and here you can see we're returning values and you know we had to to be a little careful here with how we how we set things up uh, but the the bottom line is it all works and um you know the the nice thing is it's a much simpler definition so that's uh, following the dan friedman philosophy you get something working first and then you can massage it to something much cleaner so if you want if you want to try homework assignment Take this version, which I'll check in. I'll check in the various versions. Take this version and modify it, so it's like the first version that we modified, where it can take a done argument. Okay. Um, there you go. So that is an alternate syntax for run in mini Canrin that is attempting to capture the feel of the prolog equivalent. 
Um, and it's also showing that, you know, it is possible to define, you know, a new new macro syntax uh, in a way that doesn't, the macro itself doesn't have to be that long. Um, now, in this case, we did some massaging to pull out the parts that weren't necessary. But that's also another thing to to know about good macro design and scheme, at least, that it it's good to pull out the helpers that you can. And as, 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 a, as an effect of that, um, we could actually use the name next if we wanted to. Um, you know, you could also combine these approaches in, in various ways, okay? So it's up to you to decide what, what should come out of the macro. Uh, here we're being uh, aggressive about it. So uh, think about it. You know, I encourage you to play around with these things. I'm going to check this code in uh, so you can try running things. Just, just be a little careful that you're going to have to make sure that you're running this code inside of the faster hyphen mini Kenrin repository. And you're, you're going to need to make sure to load mk hyphen vicari.scm and mk.scm if you're using Shea Scheme. You can also modify this code to work under Racket. There is an mk.rkt wrapper. Um, you know, depending on exactly how you do things, you might need to make a, a Racket wrapper for this code, or probably you can just change the file name to rkt, but you might need to do like a require instead of a load in some cases. So, you know, if you know Racket, you can probably find your way around that. Um, if not, if you're having trouble, you know, you can ask for help. Um, but there you go. That's really what I wanted to work up to. And, you know, you can kind of ignore the mini Kenrin -y details for this. The important thing is we were able to change the syntax and get an interface that's like Prolog. If you want to try another macro homework experiment, we can go back to the test diverge macro we looked at last time to test divergent expressions. And we could do a different version that's kind of a mashup of what we're doing here with run a little, where we can pull answers from the stream and uh, what we did with something like test diverge, where sometimes you want to test two versions of a mini Canron relation where you believe the relation returns the same answers, but potentially in a different order. And maybe they're inflame any answers. So sometimes it's useful to have a test macro where what you're really testing is that a certain relation or a certain run a little, let's say, will eventually produce all the answers in a set of, of answers. So you could say, here's a set of 10 values, and here is a run a little expression, and I'm claiming that eventually that run a little, if you keep calling next enough times, will produce all the answers within that set. And furthermore, you could also give a timeout. You could combine it with engines and say, here's the number of ticks I'm willing to allocate to the compute to see if I can generate all of those answers, okay? So if you write that macro, you're combining run a little and the pulling on the stream a little bit at a time, or the equivalent of run a little, you could use the guts that we've, we've uh, identified here. You're using the ability to write a custom test macro. You're using a set of answers and pull, you know, you know, removing things there. And also you're using engines or some other sort of timed preemption uh, feature so that something that might diverge uh, or take a million years, you can you can bound how long you want that test to run. So I think that's actually a pretty good uh, test example you know, for homework. I've written that sort of macro before. So that would be the challenge I would give to you if you want to make sure you really understand how this works. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that if you are interested in mini Kenrin and you've maybe implemented your own micro Kenrin or mini Kenrin, I encourage you to think about alternate run interfaces and uh, think about, you know, what what interface might you find useful? You know, Dan and I originally thought people would, would go wild with it because we're in Scheme and we have macros. That wasn't really the case. Uh, I'll also say that um, Jason Heeman pointed out to me that uh, Dan Heeman and I think uh, one or more of his students has a recent paper at Trends in Functional Programming talking about alternate 
um, run interfaces from Mini Canon, which I just learned about. Although the approach they're taking is different. My, uh, my understanding is that they were trying to avoid the use of macros, presumably so that it's maybe easier for people to understand and easier to port to other languages. Whereas here, we're going the other way. You know, we're sort of leaning into the macros and saying, okay, if we're using Scheme or some other language like a Lisp with macros or, you know, maybe Rust or, you know, pick your language with hygienic macros that's not a Lisp, um, you know, what could you do and what what sort of interfaces might you want to have? Okay, so lots to think about, lots to play around with. If you come up with something interesting, you know, feel free to let me know or post it somewhere. Uh, be happy to take a look and um, I think that's it. I will think more about other uh, types of macros, but I, I did want to show macros in a real world context that I've actually spent time uh, thinking about. All right. Have a good one. Talk to you soon.